Hello again and welcome back to Bible Studies with Russ. Today we're picking up in Matthew chapter 19, looking at verse 11. Uh, last time you may remember we looked at Matthew 19, 1 through 9, uh, looking at marriage and divorce and uh, remarriage. And we discussed those things uh, for the entire period, looking at uh, the one the one reason given for divorce, as we talked about that being fornication. And today we're looking at Matthew chapter 19, picking up in verse uh, 11, which is really uh, picking up at the very end of that topic of marriage and divorce. Uh, because we know in Matthew 19 verse 10 uh, that the disciples replied after hearing the, the teaching of Christ there, uh, their reply in verse ten was his disciples said to, say unto him if the if the case of if if the case of man be so with his wife it is good not to marry from the uh, King James uh, translation there and so the idea there is pretty clear that because the teaching is so um, so strong or maybe uh, that marriage excuse me rather that the marriage the teaching on marriage divorce and remarriage is so uh, strict or so not say so very uh serious i guess strict isn't really the the word to use there but so very serious is what what we find pointed out here as they say here in verse 10 uh, it is better not to marry uh there matthew 19 verse 10 uh and then we find in verse 11 as christ continues teaching and and some some bible translations have the heading jesus teaches on celibacy I really don't think that's what he's talking about here in context. Uh, but let's look here at verse, verse 11 and following. But he said to them, All cannot accept this same, only those to whom it has been given. Uh, this is a figure of speech here, means to accept to, to accept in a mind and in a heart, to, to them whom it was given. Um, this is not saying there's just a select few to whom this teaching is given to. That's not what he's talking about at all. Uh, but to whom it is given is the person who has a sincere and open heart. He's going to listen to his words. That's who's going to accept it. Um, they to whom it is given, those who are taught and understand the will of God on this subject, is another way that Brother Patterson puts it here. And you look at verse uh, 12, he says, For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have been made, who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, who is a, who, he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Now, can they, uh, can they accept this teaching? Well, eunuchs and other individuals who have and uh, who have decided not to marry a eunuch, I've never, to my knowledge, no, heard of a eunuch being married. Um, you know, I don't know of a woman who would take a eunuch to for as her as her husband because uh, one of the greatest joys in, in the life of a woman is to bear children. And so to be, to marry a eunuch, I've never heard of that. Uh, perhaps <laughs> someone has. I I don't know. But uh, here in verse twelve, he says there are eunuchs who were born from from born thus from their mother's womb. Uh, those who are unable to have children uh, for reasons that, you know, just like today, people sometimes are have, very, have great difficulty having children. Uh, we understand, you know, talking about really the idea of uh, infertility, it seems to be the idea there in verse 12. And there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. When you say what that means, that men <laughs> made them eunuchs. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. I don't really think he's talking about here physically that it made themselves eunuchs. Uh, maybe some, though, did go to men and request to, you know, <laughs> uh, go to a priest or maybe not to a priest, someone and, and whoever did those types of things and made them a eunuch. Uh, and, or maybe they decided, hey, I'm not going to marry, I'm not going to have children. Um and that's how they made themselves eunuchs, um, which probably is, in reality, is the more uh, obvious, well, probably the more, uh, the more, uh, uh, the, the, the reason or the way a person became a eunuch uh, more often than not. Uh, Those it wouldn't be unheard of for someone to, uh, during that time, to be made a eunuch because uh, eunuchs, are looked upon as those, especially during this time period, those who did so because they want to dedica dedicate themselves for a certain purpose, maybe for the service of a king. And so a eunuch is not going to have the same desires as someone who's not a eunuch. Um, and so they want to dedicate themselves for a certain service. Here he mentions here that uh, some could become a eunuch, he says, for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Um, but the Patterson points out here in verse in verse 12, 
Uh, he says here, Jesus notes some classes of men who, to whom is given to abstain from marriage. And he mentions here eunuchs. Uh, these cannot receive the teaching of marriage and elect to stay unmarried. Eunuchs, again, will not typically be married. Again, I've never heard of a eunuch being married. Uh, others might find it necessary to abstain to abstain from marriage here uh, in times of persecution and trial because if it's time of heavy persecution, getting married, well, that would put your wife and perhaps your children in jeopardy. Um, some, as some of the apostles, might abstain from marriage in order to be involved in a religious cause, maybe in difficult places or in circumstances, so they don't marry because they again they don't want to put their their family in in harm's way. Uh, so for the sake of the kingdom of God, they voluntarily remain unmarried. And Brother Patterson also points out here, uh, he says, consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, and also 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25, uh, talking about marriage, which we'll get to, we'll get to those things later. Um, we're, this is, you know, because we're going to be looking at various books and various topics, we'll later get to uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians. Um but let's continue reading here. So that's verses 11 and 12 of Matthew chapter 19. Again, I don't think he's talking about celibacy. I know here in, in the New King James I have up on my computer, it says Jesus is teaching on celibacy. Uh, I think he's talking about those who who really who have, who are abstaining from, from marriage for certain reasons, uh, for religious reasons. I, I, don't, I want to take these two verses and say, well, here's Jesus teaching on it. Um, celibacy is the idea that a person, of course, is not going to be married, but... Uh, this really goes back to verses eleven and uh, verses one through ten to me. This is really all tied together. Uh, these individuals who, who are not uh, married for reasons of dedication to God or to to uh, or to uh, the King. Uh, but I don't like that phrase Jesus teaching on celibacy in some of these headings because there are those today who who will go beyond what Christ is talking about here. And say a person you know who who wants to be, uh, for instance, the Catholic or Catholic friends. They they teach that a person who wants to be a priest uh, cannot cannot be married. Though I think recently they may have even changed that. I don't know. They have changed a lot in the last few years. I don't, I say that kind of laughing not make, make fun of them. It's just some things have changed that I'm not. It's hard to keep up with. Um, and it could be possible that some Catholic uh, congreg- Catholic congregations, if that's the term you use. Um, at different places may may not even have some of the same things. I'm not sure. Uh, same teachings as some others. Uh, of course, you didn't have the, you know you have the uh, uh, you have the Greek Orthodox and others Orthodox of these other denominations. Um, but the Catholics, for a long time at least, uh, used, would teach that those who want to be a priest cannot be married. You know, it seems like, of course, Christ does not teach that 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 is a requirement in order to be a servant of god obviously peter was married we know that christ who christ one of the people that christ healed was peter's uh, mother-in-law which indicates to us that peter was married obviously um so we think about that you know people in the bible very clearly have served god married and unmarried and so that tells us right away that being unmarried is not a requirement to serve god that is not the case at all uh, but the reason I point out this idea about celibacy is people will take that and run with it, the same way. Well, we want to serve God. You should. You shouldn't marry. No, that's a very dangerous thing to do because some individuals, as Paul will talk about later in the Corinthian letters, those who have a strong natural desire, he says that they should marry. It's better to marry than to burn, right? And so. Uh, to be unmarried is not a requirement to serve the Lord, but we find here this idea that these individuals have chosen not to marry because they they want to serve. He says here, some made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Um, and so not a requirement to serve the Lord. Being unmarried is not a requirement to serve the Lord, unlike some uh, would have you believe today. In fact, I think many times we have seen where some individuals who have remained unmarried uh, and in denominations uh, have run into some problems. And so, uh, again, what's the best way to do? Go back and go back and look at God's teachings uh, tells us to do and follow the word of God concerning that and in all things. Now, Matthew 19, looking at verse 13, and I have the heading here, verse 13, going through. Uh, I try not to follow the headings too much that are given my, in our Bibles <laughs> because they're, sometimes they're not very accurate, like I just pointed out. But in verses 13 through uh, verse 15, you have here where Jesus uh, can, talks about how the kingdom of heaven belongs to those like little children. 
Uh, looking at verses 13 through verse 15, the Bible says, then little, then little children were brought to him, that he might put his hands on, on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them, talking about the, those who, the children and those who bring the children to him. I don't think we're, let me back up. I don't think they were rebuking the children. I think they were rebuking those who are bringing the children to him. Um, because you see it in verse 13, the little children were brought to him. Verse 14, but Jesus said, let, let, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he, laid, and he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Now, this is also found in Mark chapter 10, 13 through 16, and also Luke 18, 15 through 17. You notice how Christ deals with, I shouldn't say deal, how he handles the children here. Uh, he talks with them. And the Bible tells us he prays, prays up for them, and he and he blesses them, or he lays his hand, lays his hands on them. Verse uh, thirteen, and verse uh, verse fifteen, he might put his hands on them and pray. Uh, putting your hands on someone is is not an uncommon practice. Uh, I probably may mention this before. Sometimes some of our denominational friends do things, and because they do it, we feel like, well, now I'm uncomfortable doing that because. I feel like we're being denominational because, you know, they do that, and, and if we do that, it just kind of feels awkward. And we shouldn't be that way. And, you know, for instance, there are those, and I'm probably putting this out in some of our Bible classes here in Ulaga. There are those in the Old Testament time who, and in the New Testament time as well, when they would pray to God, they actually would lift their hands up to, to, to the heavens. Uh, now today, because of, again, some of our denominational friends have taken this and become very charismatic with it and very emotional with it, that uh, that we don't do that. I don't, I don't see that being done in the church today. I think what has happened over time is we, we see some of our denominational friends and acquaintances doing this. And we say, I am not. I don't feel comfortable doing that now because they're doing this. It seems very charismatic and it's not very genuine. And I don't want to do that because I don't want to, people think, have the same feelings about them as they do about me, so I'm not going to lift my hands, you know, in prayer when I pray to God. Uh, keeping in mind, and again, in the Bible, we find where people will, will lift their hands to God, uh, you know, like this or whatever it is may be doing when they're praying to God. Not an unscriptural thing. The, the, the point I'm making is, uh, when we talk about those types of things, is that people today, when, when that happens, if that were to happen to church, people may look at you like, why are they doing that? You know, are, are they are they wanting attention? Are they are they do they feel like they got the the Holy Spirit? They mean it some charismatic way. Uh, what are they doing? It would probably come under question more and cause a lot of confusion more than it would anything else. Uh, but it is literally, literally it's not a unscriptural thing to do that to put to to lift your hands or here in this instance he was putting his hands on the children and praying for them. I, I remember one brother when he was having uh, getting to to be married the photographer was there doing some pictures and she wanted us to in one picture to put our put, to put our hands on him and and look like we were praying um that is not an unbiblical view or unbiblical act to do that i think sometimes you know we, we do that we, it really kind of shows some closeness uh to me it shows you know, since a little bit of sincerity but we've kind of moved away from that because of the stigma that now kind of goes with that what we feel very dominational we got to put my hand on this person and now it's now it's really holy you know and so a lot of things have been you might say almost ruined because of things like that but here in verse 13 through 15, this is what Christ does. He puts his hands on them, and he's going to pray in verse in verse 15. And he laid his hands on them, and he departed from there. That indicates he laid his hands on them, and he prayed, and then he left there. Um, again, I, when I think about that, I think about that as just being a sign of closeness and, and concern and and uh, showing a, a genuine love and interest in that person, or in, or in this case, in the children. But he says in verse 14, Let, let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them, for of such is a kingdom of heaven. Now, what he's talking about here is he's not talking about the only children are in the kingdom of heaven, obviously. But the idea here clearly is that their their disposition, their uh, innocence, as Brother Patterson puts it here, he says the, the disposition or character is to that which he refers. Children are what? They're, they're, we look at them many times as harmless, as innocent. Uh, as pure and we understand people say well i know some children are kind of rowdy yeah okay but that's what we're talking about here we're talking about children that he most most children what can we do when you think of a child we think well we can sit down we can talk with them and we kind of we kind of get tickled at some of their 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 uh their things that they say and their ways of thinking and sometimes are very are very simple 
uh, when I say simple, I mean they're very direct. They're very cut and dry sometimes. Children can see things that we don't see, or they can just say things in such a way we're like, you know what, that's spot on. We say sometimes, you know, out of the mouth of babes, because what a child says is just so spot on and so and so clear and so uh, you know perfect to describe a situation. Okay, now next in Matthew chapter 19, looking at verses 16 uh, through about verse uh, 22 here, you have the question that comes up, what must a man do to have eternal life? And, and you know, again, some Bible translations talk about the rich young ruler. Uh, same, same section here. Um, this is also found in Mark 10, 17 through 22, and Luke 18, 18 through 23. Now, we're going to read through this uh, a little bit, then we're going to make some comments here. Uh, Looking at verse 16, Now, behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And this is very interesting because this is a this is the direct question. What must I do to have eternal life? He's literally asking, What can I do to have, what can I do to be saved, right? And it's interesting that he says there, notice, notice what he what he asks. He says, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? Now, there are those today who will say, well, we understand, we understand, for instance, that, or what we do, that we cannot do something to gain heaven, meaning we cannot do something that's going to merit us having heaven as our home. And there are some today who, when we, when we talk about that, when we look at verse 16, they say, well, see, when you talk about baptism, you're talking about how it's a work, and you're, and you're trying to earn your salvation, that's what people are talking about when they say you're know, trying to earn your salvation. They look here in verse 16. They say, "Well, see, you can't earn. You can't. There's not something you you have you have to do to have eternal life." And actually, there is something you have to do. There are many things one has to do. Uh, and it's not it's not referencing earning eternal life. It's referencing obedience. You know, you think about when when God gave the command to Noah to build the ark. Was he was he trying to earn earn salvation, or was he trying to obey God? Well, in reality, he was trying to obey God, and thereby, him by him obeying God, he does what? He earns salvation in that way. We do that. We earn salvation by obedience to God's command. And God's commands require us to do things. Looking at verse 16, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? In verse 17, I know it's, it's interesting to me, the first thing he does is he addresses, he asks the question, Why do you call me good? Um. And then he gets into addressing the question he's, that he's, he has asked. But he asks first, why do you call me good there in verse 17? Uh, or literally, why are you asking me concerning the good? As Brother Patterson points here, the literally, literally says, why are you asking me concerning the good? He says there, there is only one good in absolute sense, and that is God. And he says in verse 17, no one is, is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, we understand today we are not under the New Test. We're not under rather. We're not under the. We are under the New Testament. We're not under the Ten Commandments, which are part of the old law, because we all probably have heard people ask the question: You have to keep the Ten Commandments today. And the correct answer to that is no. But we also have to realize that the that nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in Bible principle in the New Testament. The only one that's not repeated in biblical principles is keeping the Sabbath because we today realize that we don't keep the Sabbath. We, we, we worship on the first day of the week. Now, some people will say today, well, well we're, you know, Sunday's a new Sabbath. No, it's not. Sabbath has always been Saturday. Now, it's not, the Sabbath is not Saturday any longer because the Sabbath is part of the old law that was nailed at the cross. As Paul tells us there, uh, when Christ went to the cross, he, 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 nailed, he nailed those uh you know those things which are contrary to us, they were nailed to the cross. Now, when you ask that question, the, talking about the Ten Commandments, you think about how many of those, how all those things are actually repeated throughout the New Testament. You know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Does God condemn idolatry? Yes, absolutely. You remember when the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts goes in and he sees all those false gods? And he says, the one, you know, the one God you do not know, it is, you know, it is him who, he, I'm paraphrasing here, it's him who I'm going to speak to you about today, right? What was he doing through that? He was going to be condemning all the false gods. So is, thou shalt have only one God, and thou shalt have no other God before me? Is that condemned? Yes. Is still condemned? Yes. The him he, he stole still no more? I mean, that's pretty clear, right? Uh, murder is condemned. Uh, you know, 
Christ told Peter, who were, you know, he were lives by the sword, shall also die by the sword. Remember when Peter drew the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus when Christ was carried was being ready to be taken to, to judgment to that uh, joke of a trial. Uh, so murder is condemned. And the list goes on and on. And we find over and over again where those nine of the Ten Commandments are recorded or repeated rather in biblical principle throughout the New Testament. And so when someone asks, do we te- keep the Ten Commandments today? No. But we need to clarify that if we say it that way. Because we need to make sure people understand that, first of all, the Ten Commandments are part of the old law. And are we under the old law today? No. When people start saying, well, you're saying we don't keep the Ten Commandments? We have to we have to be willing and ready to support what we're talking about. The Ten Commandments, again, are repeated in principle in the New Testament. Looking at verse 17, it says, We want to enter into life, keep the commandments. To, for us today, we'd, we, he would it'd be worded this way, basically. We want to enter into life. What do you do? Keep what? Keep the word of God, right? Which is the New Testament. Keep, you know, obey the gospel and continue to obey the gospel, right? Revelation 2, verse 10. In verse 18, and he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus just report, just recorded all those things in the New Testament, right? He just made them part of the New Testament. That we these things are going to be part of what we are to keep still today. You notice, though, what is omitted here? Now, we understand, and until Christ goes to the cross and the old law is nailed to the cross, until those things take place, they're under the old law. But notice here, he, notice how he does not mention keeping the Sabbath. Now, we know if you go back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, the Bible tells us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, what is that? What is that? It's more part of the, new, part of the uh, Ten Commandments, right? But, as we look into the New Testament, we find what are we to do? We're to worship on the first day of the week. Well, the first day of the week is Sunday. The first day of the week is not Saturday. So that tells us, are we to keep the Sabbath? No, we are not. It is not part of the New Testament. So when we start talking to people about the Ten Commandments, people start asking about the Ten Commandments, do we keep them today? Do we keep, do we keep them? In reality, we, keep, we do keep nine of them, but they're not the Ten Commandments. We, when we find them in the New Testament, we shouldn't call them nine of the Ten Commandments, because they're not. They're just commandments. As we find them in the Old Testament, yeah, they're the Ten Commandments, but in the New Testament, what are they? They're part of the Gospel of Christ. They're part of what we are to follow today. And so we, we need to be really careful how we how we address that and make sure that we uh, don't simply just say, oh, no, we don't keep the Ten Commandments, because we do keep them as they are found in the New Testament law, but they're no longer, I would not still call them the Ten Commandments today. Um. And he says here in verse 18, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't you wish everybody kept these things today? <laughs> I mean, the Bible is is the answer to all a man's problems. Just these things alone here in verse 18, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall bear shall not bear false witness. Those Four things right there alone would change an entire nation. But he's not done. He says in verse 19, honor your father and your mother. There's another huge one, right? Man, they're all huge. And love your neighbor as yourself. Those things would change a nation, let alone the heart of man. And we people start asking, you know, what can we do today? Go back to the Bible. Go back to the Bible. The Bible will solve all man's and all, all the nation's problems that we have. They can be solved by obedience to God's word. Going back to verse 20, the young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Now, uh, his claim, of course, means, uh, course, does not mean he actually did keep them. As Brother Patterson points out here, again, you heard me talk about Brother Max Patterson, whose commentary I use here. Uh, he says his claim, he calls it a claim, of course, does not mean he actually did keep them. The question, he says, what what lack I, what lack I yet, or as he, the New King James says, what do I still lack? May reveal an uneasy conscience. You know, what else am I missing? Um, you know, it's not, he could have been doing all these things, but you know the one person he knew? Christ. Now, Christ knows how, he knows what is in the heart of man. He knows our thoughts, our intentions. He knows what's important to us. He knows what in our what our mind in our mind what is the most important thing in life. And so, with those things in mind, what does Christ ask him next? 
And what does he say to him next in verse 21? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, and notice what does Christ do? Go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. He hits him in a pocketbook, effectively, right? Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He, he addresses uh, materialism, and he addresses the treatment of one's finances there in verse 21, right? He says, go sell everything you have and give, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. In verse 22, but the young man, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That tells us this man was clinging on too tightly to material things. He was hanging on too tight. And the Bible says in verse 22, he went away sorrowful. He went away upset. What did Christ tell him to do? Sell everything you have and, and, give, your, give, the, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Christ said, if you did these things, you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, it's much easier to read this than it is to apply it. But if, if we're willing to give up everything physically, we are going to have the ability to do what? If we're willing to do that, that's going to change everything. And what Christ is doing here in verse 21, we, he, point, he is able to reveal to this, young, to this person, to the young ruler, um, as he's called here in many Bible translations, he, he reveals to him that what? He's not perfect. That he still is, he still has things he needs to work on. Because what does he do? He doesn't just go away. He doesn't say, no, forget that and just leave. In verse 22, the Bible says he went away sorrowful. He went away sad because Christ tells him to tell to say everything that he has. Um, now, we're going to stop there. Um, verse 23 through 30 is, is no doubt going in with what we're talking about here. It really ties in with what Christ just talked about in verse uh, 21 and 22. That is material possessions, right? And and being rich. And so we're going to stop there today. When we come back next time, we're going to pick it up because there's a lot of material there. And in the time we have remaining, there won't be enough to, to uh, discuss these things. So we're going to pick it up next time in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23. And so I th- do thank you for being here with me today. Hope you enjoyed this Bible study. And hope you have been encouraged by it. And hope to see you again next time.